I'm going to capitalize a little bit on what Paul started here. You know, there's another aspect of this uh, water pitcher and thing here, and that is that we come this evening to get a drink. And when we have our cup turned up like this, we can put water in it and we can take a drink. If our cups are turned up, we'll receive something tonight. If our cups are like this, we're not going to get anything. There's nothing to drink. We need our cups turned up. We need our hearts open. Brother Emmanuel shared with us last night. Well, I don't know how all this worked out. I was debating today whether or not we should sit as families tonight. And I walk in this evening and somebody already had family seating on the board. So God was here before I was. Amen. I'd like to talk tonight about revival in our marriages. I'm talking to largely married people, yet at the same time I know there's some sitting here who are not married. Maybe some of you will never get married, maybe some of you will. But marriage is an institution that God ordained a long time ago, clear back in the garden. And so it's a right thing to uh, talk about, it's a right thing. But to those of you who are not married, and maybe someday you will be married, I think there's some things here that you can learn and, and we can all learn together. And there's some things here also for those of you who will never be married. There's some things here that I think you also can learn. Or never have married. When God made man, he made man with a need. In fact, he made him... And then he made, or he, made the, uh, the, he made the animals, and then he made man. And before he ever even made the woman, he said, it's not good that man should be alone. But he brought all the animals to Adam, and he named all the animals, and he found there, the Bible says, there's not a help meet there for Adam. But he... So he then therefore made Adam to go to sleep. He had made Adam out of dust. He made Adam to go to sleep there and he took a rib out of his side and he created woman. Because man had a need. Now I like to think of it this way and, and, I, and I feel this way about you ladies, you sisters, and especially my wife. You know, we're just dust. We men, we're just dirt. You know, we're just, we're just, just dirt. But God made us into a very, our bodies are very, very intricate and very refined. You ladies were taken from that refined part of man. Very, very refined. And I just like to, I like that. I like to think of my wife as a little more refined than I am. Of course, she actually is as far as that's concerned. But she is and our wives are very intricate creatures. Are they not, husbands? Amen. Well, we'll talk a little more about that later. But God made men, man, and he had a need. And you know, when he made a woman, she had a need too. She needed man. So my question to us tonight is this. Husbands, are you meeting your wife's needs? And wives, are you meeting your husband's needs? We each have needs. The Bible tells us that. We understand that. We who have been married for any length of time at all, see that we have needs. Husbands, are you meeting your wife's needs? Wives, are you meeting your husband's needs? That's my question tonight. And also, to us as couples tonight, do we need revival in our marriage relationship? Is it a bit dry or is it a bit stale or is it a bit dull 
Or maybe there's even some stress or some strain in there. Maybe you just have a hard time getting along with her. Maybe it's all her fault. You ever thought of that? Or maybe it's all his fault. Well, I have some things to say about that later, too. Do we need revival in our marriage relationships? <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Bridegroom. We want to be your bride this evening. Your chosen, spotless, holy bride. Would you open our hearts tonight to look into that beautiful picture and examine our marriages in the light of who you are to us and who we are to you. Father, the ocean is big and our ships are small. Chart our course this evening, we pray, Father. Cover us with your protective hand and bring us to harbor safe and pure for you, our groom. That's our prayer tonight, Father. Baptize us with a baptism of honesty tonight, Father, that we all would be honest. We want to be a glorious church without spot or wrinkle for you. <clears throat> So we come begging you for clarity, for conviction, and if needed, repentance tonight. That you would make changes in our homes, Lord, as needed for your glory. Lord, you know the needs in our marriages, in our homes, in our lives. They are so glaring to you. You can see them. They stand out. Wash us, Father, in the blood of Jesus Christ tonight. And Father, I would pray that you would humble me as your servant to use me, Lord, that through me you might speak, Father, and that there might be a revival tonight in our marriages. Lord, that we might go forth from this place new creatures, New husbands and new wives, Lord, if that's what we need to be, Father. We're open, we, our cups are turned up, Father, and we're thirsty for a drink. So, Father, I pray that you would fill our cup tonight. And help us, Father, to meet the standard of the marriages, of the marriage uh, uh, that, you have, that you have instituted, Father, to meet up to that standard. It's a high standard. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to meet there, Lord. To come up there, Father. To be honest with ourselves. To be honest with our husbands and with our wives. Father, that you might receive the glory. Help us, Father, we pray. Our cups are turned up and we need a drink, Lord. We're thirsty tonight. And so, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> You know, a marriage is a thing that God instituted and it's, it's a holy thing to him. God instituted this marriage between a husband and a wife and it's a holy thing to him. There is a certain, I guess I'll call it spirit, that comes at a wedding between a man and a wife. And they are joined together. And they are made one because God said what he has joined together. Let not man put asunder. And he said they twain two shall be one flesh. There's something that bonds together at a wedding, at a marriage. When two people, a man and a woman are bonded together in, in a marriage, in, in holy matrimony. There's something happens. And there's a spirit. There's a, there's a joining together right there. And this evening I would like to help us to see some of the very practical points that can, can, can bring our marriages together a little more tonight. I have some very practical questions I want to ask. I have some very practical thoughts that I've had. <clears throat> so let's go into that now. <clears throat> so what does it matter? What does it matter if my marriage is a little bit rocky. If my marriage is a little strained. <clears throat> what does it matter if I act like 
I love my spouse, and yet my actions prove a little differently. We may all love our spouses, amen. I trust God we do. But our actions prove very quickly and very rapidly how much we love them and if we love them. They read us very, very clearly. They tell on us. <clears throat> what does it matter if I just spoke sharply to my wife before I got out of the van this evening? What does it matter if my children seem relatively happy and contented in my home? What does it matter? <clears throat> God says that He wants a church that is without spot or wrinkle. And He likens marriage to that. He wants a church that is pure and spotless and blameless. That's what God wants. He wants a bride for His Son that is pure. We are like that bride. We in our marriages are like that relationship. If God wants a pure, spotless bride, I believe God wants our marriages to be pure and spotless. If you went to the closet some, some, some morning, brother, and you, you, uh, there was a shirt hanging there, and it, it was dirty, it had a grease spot on it, and a couple ink spots on the shirt, or some, on the pocket, or something like that, you wouldn't wear it. You would probably say, this is dirty, and put it in the clothes hamper. You would say, it's not fit for me to wear. It needs washed. It needs cleaned. <clears throat> and that's what we'd like to do tonight. To just hold up this shirt and look at it. Is it wrinkle-free? Is it spotless? Or are there dirty spots on it? I'd like us to all go home tonight with our shirt clean, wrinkle-free, spotless. That's what I'd like. Because the strength of the church is dependent upon the strength of the marriage. And if the marriage is spotted and wrinkled and dirty, and something's wrong, so will the church be that way too. <clears throat> Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to begin in verse 1. And then uh, read 1 and 2 and then skip down to 20. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Down to verse 20. Giving thanks always, for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined into his wife, 
and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. We see as we read in this, in this chapter how that the church and its relation to Christ is in, is, and our relationship to one another as husband and wife, how it just, it's just interweaved in between. How that Paul uses the, the relationship between man and a wife to explain the relationship between Christ and the church. And again, Christ wants and deserves and will have a holy bride someday, a pure bride, a spotless bride. And he is likening, Paul is likening our marriage to that union. So may we, as we consider tonight some of these questions that I have for you, think about it and say, is that me? Am I spotless and pure? Am I holy in my relationship with my wife? Is my, as I look at my priorities, and I determine what is my highest priority. And I believe that Christ and our relationship with Him is our first and foremost priority. He says one place that if you will not forsake mother and father and houses and lands and all of that, you cannot be my disciple. That is number one priority. But I believe there's a number two priority too. And that is the husband and wife relationship. Number two priority in life. So... As we consider this subject tonight, I would like us just to just consider we're all just a family here tonight. <clears throat> there would be more spiritual subjects maybe that we could talk about and talk in more spiritual language. But I'd like to get real practical tonight and ask some real, maybe even personal questions. And I was glad, like I said, when I saw the family seating on the board here. It might be a time for you to look at one another and nod your head. It might be a time for you to look at one another and say, I'm sorry. It might be a time for you to take and reach, hold, reach over there and squeeze her hand and say, I love you, honey. I don't know. But tonight I'd like it just to, just to get kind of personal tonight. If Satan can destroy the home, he can destroy the church. If he can destroy the church... He can destroy Christ's bride and he can get his way all the more. Now we know that God is going to win out in the end. We know that. We know that he will have a, a pure spotless bride. We know that. <clears throat> so as we go into this this evening, let's just let's just get a little bit personal. Our marriages, our picture of Christ in the church. A little poem. Your marriage is a picture of Christ and his bride. Does this picture the beauty portray? Can the world in its darkness see Jesus shine through in the picture you paint every day? If someone stayed at your house for six months or a year, what would they go away saying? Would they say they just got a privilege to watch a beautiful example of Christ and the church and his bride lived out daily in their lives? If somebody, if, if somebody was to come live in your home, and maybe we could even imagine they were invisible. You couldn't see them. What would they say when they walked away from your home? You know, in those times when the doors are all closed and you just got home from work. And you're tired. And things didn't happen well around the house. Or things didn't go well for you. You know what I mean. The times when you're stressed. How you react. What would that person go away saying? If he lived in your home for six months or a year. Would he be able to say, beautiful. I want a home like that. Or would he be able to say, I'm going to look somewhere else for example. I don't know. I don't know. But I know, I know, even in the godliest marriages, there is stress. I know that. 
And I know that sometimes it's, it's pretty easy to let my flesh rise up and take control. It's pretty easy sometimes to let myself take over. It's pretty easy to get kind of selfish sometimes. I know that. I admit that. I confess that. My wife knows that. My family knows that. But we're reaching for not just an average. or We're not just reaching for something a little better. We're reaching for the best. And that is like Christ and His bride. A picture of perfect perfection. Amen. That's what we're wanting, wanting to have in our marriages. So number one, two questions. Does my marriage need revival? Number two, if so, how can I bring about revival? And I'd like to talk about that first question first. <clears throat> The Father already knows the answers to these questions. You can choose to answer honestly or dishonestly. I'm hoping and praying you will answer honestly tonight. Very likely, we're not hiding anything from our companions either. They know us. They read us. They know who we are. They live with us every day. But let's be honest with ourselves and seek out this revival that we're looking for in our marriage. You remember, you know how it was. Your wedding day and the week following or the year following. You remember how it was. I mean, it was just glorious. Nothing could get better. Here I have my bride. This one I have wanted for a while. It's, it's a need that I'm going to have fulfilled in my life. Or my husband. My groom, there's a need that's going to be fulfilled in my life. It's a beautiful thing. I'd like to say that every day I get up, I could do that with my wife. And I could say, beautiful. I love you. I'm glad I married you. And if I had it to do all over again, I'd do it a thousand times again. That's what I want to see out of your marriages. That's what I think God wants. Because, just think about it. Do you think Christ will ever get up in the morning? And I don't suppose it'll be this way in heaven, but do you suppose he'll ever get up in the morning and feel a bit ouchy toward his bride? I don't think so. I don't think so. So let's, let's pursue that end. Let's pursue that perfect end. <clears throat> a question. Does my marriage need revival? That's the question. Now underneath of that, I have several other questions. Does my companion know without a shadow of doubt that I am 100% faithful to him or her? Does my companion know that I am without a shadow of doubt, 100% faithful? And that means in lots of areas. Faithful with our money. Does he, she know that I am faithful with it? I am honest with it. I don't spend it foolishly. I am careful with it. I am conservative with it. I honor him. Wives, when I spend it. I have his blessing for what I spend it on and how much I spend for what I spend. Can he trust you? Could he hand you a checkbook and never look at it? Not to say that's always wise, but... 100% trust and faithful. <clears throat> How about, you know, you know, 100% uh, faithful to him or her. Can he or she trust you? Trust. It's a little like money. Trust is earned. You know, forgiveness is something we choose to do. It's something I say, I choose to forgive and I give my forgiveness. But trust is earned. You know how it is. If a husband or a wife is unfaithful in some way to him or her, to the other one, the other one can say, I forgive you. I forgive you. But trust is earned. He or she doesn't necessarily automatically trust. And it's not wrong that she doesn't because trust is earned. It's like money. It's earned. If I want to buy a car or buy a house or buy something, I have, it takes time for me to earn that money to buy that thing. That's the same way trust is. Trust is earned. How about 
faithful in the way we train the children. As you as husband and wife, mother and father, as you are married, you have children. They come in to the home and you sit down and you decide, OK, let's train our children a way, a certain way. Training children takes time. It takes effort. It takes diligence. It, it, it's, it, you can't be a lazy person and train children in the right way. When Papa's off to work and Mama's here with the children and there's something happens with the children, is she faithful? Are you faithful, mothers, to train the way you know Papa wants you to? And Papa, when you come home, are you faithful also to train the way you have agreed together to train? Does my companion have a hundred percent confidence in me that I am faithful to each other? How about with my words, faithful with my words, the things I say, am I honest? Am I honest with what I say? Do I exaggerate? Good question. Do I sometimes say things the way I want them to be told so that I look good? Or maybe even worse than that, somebody else looks bad. Am I faithful with my words? Can she trust me with what I say? If I tell her, honey, I'm going to do this or this or this, does she without a doubt know you will? Because in the past you have proven that you will do what you say and that you have that your words are honest. You have not exaggerated and they are exactly what you did. Faithful with words, faithful with my time. Does my marriage need revival? Faithful with my time. Am I diligent with my time? Or am I lazy? Just a question. <clears throat> Faithful with my eyes. We generally think about men when we think about that. And that's probably usually the, uh, one of the places that men should look at. Where, where is our eyes? Where does our eyes go? Men, can you give your wife an absolute assurance that your eyes are in total control, 100% faithful? Ladies, you know, you can have eyes for other things, too. You can have eyes for a new dress. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a lady. I don't know what all you might, might desire and look at that, that maybe you shouldn't. Faithful with our eyes. Faithful like I am faithful to no other person on earth. Faithful to my spouse. Faithful like I'm faithful to, faithful to no other person. You know, I believe that a husband and a wife should put no effort into having confidence in her spouse or, her, or, or, or our spouses. No effort into the thought of faithfulness. No effort into that. We just know. We just know. Papa's faithful. Mama's faithful. I don't have to wonder. Number two. <clears throat> How about our selfishness or our selflessness? <clears throat> you know, Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. Everything he gave up. He gave up his life, his physical life. He gave up his relationship with his father. He gave it up. He laid it down. Because we had a need. How about us? Am I unselfish in my willingness to give to my wife or wives to your husbands? Are you unselfish? Selfless in this area. You know, <clears throat> we could also, we, we, we learn to know each other and we learn to know what each other wants and what, you, what each other doesn't want. I wonder, do we have to be asked to do something or do we, if, if we know it needs to be done, we just do it. Selfless. Or not do something. Whatever it may be. If we, 
If we can be totally selfless, we will be glad to get up from the table and go wash the dishes, for example. Or dry the dishes while she washes. You know, you may be surprised, husbands, how that may bless your wife. And maybe you all do it. I don't know. Just to have him get up from the table without any asking and say, I'll dry the dishes for you tonight. I think you'd be surprised maybe what that would do to your wife. I think she would appreciate it. How many wives would appreciate that? <laughs> okay. I, I didn't mean to tell on your husbands there. Sorry, wives. Remember, our perfect example was Christ. He said, or he, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did something before we even asked for it. He knew we had a need. While we were yet sinners, he, Christ died for us. He was ahead of us. Selfishness or selflessness. Does his or her requests irritate me? Do they ever irritate me? Are his or her interests higher than my interests? Am I more concerned about her comfort or her whatever it may be, health, safety, whatever it is, than I am my own? More concerned about helping her than helping me. Is I'm sorry a frequent phrase used between you? You know, probably it's necessary. Uh, it's probably necessary. It is in our home. Does your wife feel led? Or are you leading, wives? Husbands, does your wife feel led? You know what I mean? You know, led in, in spiritual uh, things and, and even in everything. Led in, led in life. Does she feel led? Are you out in front of her, leading her? Saying, let's go this direction. Let's go this way. <clears throat> it's your responsibility. Does your husband feel followed? Wives, does your husband feel followed? Does he feel like he is definitely being followed and supported? Not tagging way back here, but right up here behind you. Right, even beside of you, following right along. Wives, that's a question for you. Is there any sacrifice too great that you wouldn't make for her? Now, I know that needs some qualification, but take it like I mean it. Where you have the opportunity to sacrifice for her, are you willing to? Or do you rather just back off and let things go? Number three. How about the level of courtesy or just downright politeness in your relationship? <clears throat> you know those wedding vows you spoke? Did they make your love strong just because you spoke those wedding vows? I don't think so. But the courtesies that you exercise and practice before the wedding or even right after the wedding is just as vital and necessary today, 27 or 8 years later, 10 years later, 40 years later. Now I grant, we begin to understand each other a little better. I know that. I understand that. But we can become discourteous without even hardly realizing it sometimes. Maybe we should take a look at our courtesy to our wife, to our husband. <clears throat> what about our wedding vows? Are we really keeping our wedding vows? You know, some of us have made some pretty high vows. I, 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 I marvel sometimes at, at, the, at the height and the, the uh, uh, I don't know what, the high standard that some of these vows are that we hear today. They're pretty high. Although I don't know that they're any higher than some of the ones we have made either. If we, if we live out the spirit of the vow... Not just the law. And that's, a, that's another thought. You know, the spirit of the vow. In essence, you said you would be faithful to your wife regardless of anything. You've promised to live with her 
honor her, cherish her, all those things you promised to do. Are we keeping the spirit of the vow? <clears throat> Real practical. How long has it been since you opened the door for your wife? How long has it been, wives, since you welcomed him at the door when he came home? You know, this level of courtesy, I believe that there's also some value in cleanliness in our relationship. Now, I know we get dirty at work and, and we don't always smell so good, we men. But maybe we could take into consideration our wives a little bit. You know, while you may not smell yourself, she does. And, and I know it doesn't smell too pleasant sometimes. So I'm just encouraging you. You know, take a look at that sometime. You want revival in your marriage relationship? That's just a little thing you can do. But it does have an effect. We're not dependent upon that. We're not, we're not going to say that if, if he always smells bad, that I'm not going to love him. That's not the case. But if there's something we can do, let's do it. Uh, please, thank you. I appreciate you. Are they common words between you? Please, thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> One of the things that we have tried to cultivate in our home is that sons, they do the heavy work. Mother comes home from the grocery or wherever she goes to get something and, and she comes home with a van load of groceries or, or whatever she comes home with. I think it's good that we as husbands and we teach our sons to do the same thing. To jump up, run out and help her carry the groceries in. It makes her feel cherished. It makes her feel loved. You know, some of us carry a, carry a lunchbox to work and, and sometimes we, uh, we carry sandwiches or whatever we take. And, and just to you wives, do you try to keep his lunch cool? If it needs to be cool, of course, hot if it needs to be hot. You know, do you put extra effort into that? He appreciates that. It's the spirit of the thing. It's the spirit of what I'm talking about here. This spirit of wanting to please one another. Wanting to serve one another. <clears throat> what about your spiritual relationship? Do you pray together? Is she free to unload her sin on you without feeling condemnation? Is he free to unload his sin on you without feeling cond condemnation? What about your spiritual relationship? I think she should be. I think he should be free to. <clears throat> Are your hearts flowing together in love for Jesus to serve him, to teach your children together, flowing together in love for Jesus? Do you talk about him in your home? Is Jesus a byword in your home? <clears throat> how about what, husbands when we, uh, how much do we value our wives in this spiritual thing? We have our quiet time and our devotion in the morning. Do we get up and do that with an interest in your wife? As you go out and you meet with the family and have your family devotions. Are you so concerned and so in love with her that you have a desire to feed her with something in the morning or whenever you may do it? How much do you love her? What about your spiritual relationship? Is she getting the message that she is so important to you? And her spiritual life and self and soul are so important to you that you spend time just digging something out of the Word to wash her with in the morning. How important is she to you? <clears throat> it's our responsibility, men. How about your confidence in each other? 
Are there any secrets between you? You have a secret that she doesn't know. And I know there's maybe times when that's, there would be some place for that maybe, but generally speaking, if you can't with a clear conscience share with your wife or share with your husband whatever's on your heart, I say there's a red flag should go up. Anything you can't say to one another? Any desire or dream or joy or pain or hope or yearning? Any feeling you can't share? Is there, is there any kind of a blockage in there? Anything? I, I think that when we, when we meet Christ, I know it'll be this way. When we as a bride meet Him, there will be nothing, nothing that He won't share with us and there's nothing that we won't share with Him. That's our example. That's our example. <clears throat> and I don't know how y you all know me a little bit, and I, I wanted to touch on this a little bit. It's that romance level, you know? I like romance. But you know, I think there's a place for that. Read the Song of Solomon sometime. I just challenge you a little bit, husbands, wives. Do you still say those lovey-dovey things sometimes to her? You know, I think it's good that we do. I'd encourage you to. See, a relationship where there's love flowing, where there's openness, where there's communication, when that happens, when there's that kind of a relationship, she's not going to make fun of you or, you know, I think she's going to like the little extra attention you give her in that way. You know, there's also something that we need to cultivate. You're standing out here somewhere and, in, and, and uh, there's a crowd here of people and you see your wife or you see your husband walking towards you. What does your heart do? I think it should thrill. Now, I know that there's emotions involved and all of that, that sometimes, you know, that affects the, the, the romantic side of life. But I'm saying in general, let's cultivate that kind of an attitude. You love to see your wife walking towards you. Take notice of her and bless her. Take her hand. She walks up beside of you. <clears throat> Well, that's all my questions. How did you score? Is there any need for a revival or any need for change in your hearts, in your, in your marriage? You know, marriages don't fall apart in one day. One small misunderstanding. One small word spoken in anger or just frustration or an impatient word or an explanation that was not given can grow into an ever-widening crack to where someday when you try to cross that crack, many, many tears will fall. Let's take care of it before, before it gets to crack. <clears throat> I would trust there's not, but... You know, there is such a thing as what I would call the spirit of divorce. We may be living together, and it may even look like everything's okay on the outside, but there could easily be a spirit of divorce in our marriages, in our homes. Divorce just simply means separation. Is there any kind of a spirit like that in any way, in our hearts, in our homes, in our marriages? anything. Like I said, marriages, the homes are not broken apart in one day. Now to the second question, how can I bring revival to my marriage relationship? How can I do it? If some of these questions you've answered and yes, you see a lacking here and you see a failing there. Yes, I see that I should have said I'm sorry and, and, and you know things aren't flowing. 
You know, sometimes we get stressed out. Sometimes things just don't flow between you. <clears throat> the example we have of Christ and his church is an absolute flow. There, is, there will be a union so sweet and so together there's no separating. That's the example we have. So how can I bring this to my marriage? Well, there is, there is a thousand and one books out there you can read to learn all about this. And, and I can't touch everything, but I'm going to touch just a few things here. Number one, I think it's important to don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. <clears throat> don't assume that she just knows you love her. Don't assume that that uh, that he will do this or that. Just don't assume anything. Find out. If you wonder, ask. If you think you should, tell her you probably should. But don't assume that she understands. She may not. Don't assume he understands. He may not. Don't assume anything. <clears throat> You know, sometimes we, we can, uh, Satan would want to get a little wedge in. This is number two. Satan would want to get a little wedge in between us as husband and wives. Be careful against, about those wedges. Very careful. Make sure you understand each other. Pride, number three, can have no place in a holy marriage. Each must be able to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I was wrong. Each should be able to apologize. Quickly seek the forgiveness of one another. Do it quickly. Don't let it go. Never cultivate the attitude... I am right. Let her come to me first. That won't cultivate a relationship that will grow. Rather, you look at yourself and you say, how can I make this thing? How can I change this thing? How can I improve our relationship? What can I do? What can I do? What did I do wrong? Find that thing. Be the first to say. Be the first to, to run to the other one. Say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Number four, selfishness must die at the marriage altar. You know, that's what an altar is. It's an altar where we lay something and we give it up. It's something we, it's some place we just lay it there, we give it up. Selfishness, lay it there on the marriage altar. Or maybe you need to lay it on the altar tonight, I don't know. Selfishness, it must go. Anything placed on an altar, you give up. It's not yours anymore. You've totally given it up. I remember Abraham there when he placed his son Isaac on the altar. He was fully expecting to kill him. Fully expecting. He had given him up. That's the way selfishness should be. We fully give it up. <clears throat> Number five. Simply understand, understanding that God made men and women differently is one of the first things to being able to blend together as husband and wife. Simply understand He made us differently. This example was given one time. It's not original with me, but men talk in ropes. They talk about a subject, they tie a knot, they conclude it. That's generally the way men talk. They talk in a rope. Women talk in spider webs. They start out here and they go here and they go here and they go here. And, and, if, and if you've ever listened to women talk to one another, it's amazing. They understand each other even. <laughs> and they can both, two of them talk at once. And they both hear. That amazes me. I can't. But that just understanding there's a difference there will be a blessing to your marriage. Generally, our inclination as men is to fix a problem. 
wife comes to, us, uh, comes to us with a problem, and so we give her the answer how to fix it. Really, what she just wants to do is communicate with you. Yes, the problem needs to be fixed. Yes, there's something that needs to be done. But she just wants to talk about it. She doesn't want the fix right then. She wants you to just listen to her. That's different than we men. We want to fix it. <clears throat> you know, sometimes wives, we men have a bit of a problem. And we just recede back into a cave a little bit. We just draw aside a little bit. We just need some time just to think this thing out and, and figure it out. And, and just simply, we just draw aside a little bit. We don't generally have the same urge that you do to want to talk about it. Generally. Everybody's different, but generally that's the way it is. Well, <clears throat> just recognize that, wives. Just recognize that. Sometimes we men need a little space. Now, I don't think it's right for men to draw back into the cave and just stay there. Again, that, that's missing the whole spirit of the message tonight. But give us some time. And if you go after him in that cave, guess where he's going to go? Farther back in the cave. And farther and farther and farther. Just give him some time. He'll come out. You stand out there. You just, you just stay out there and you go wash the dishes and pray for him. That'll be a blessing to him. Be available. You know, you could say, honey, you want to talk about it? Now that could come across two different ways. It just depends on what you've been in the past. If in the past you said, honey, want to talk about it? And then proceed to talk and talk and talk and talk. He's going to say, no, I don't want to talk about it. But if you come to him and say, honey, want to talk about it? And in the past, you've just simply left it there. Want to talk about it? No. Okay, fine. You know, just go wash the dishes and pray for him. He'll come out of that cave a lot quicker because I don't have near as far to come. <clears throat> Number six, lay down your defenses. It doesn't matter what you meant. What matters more is what she heard or felt. Or vice versa. It doesn't matter so much what she meant, but it matters what he heard or felt. That's what we have to work with. You may have meant something altogether different than what she understood, but she understood what she understood or he understood. So. Don't get defensive. Just accept that. OK, now I have to deal with this thing with the way she understood it. <clears throat> it's kind of like. Giving your wife some roses. You hand her the roses and she can either see the petals, the beautiful bloom, or she can see the thorns on the stems. And it depends upon lots of things, but a couple of things, how you handed them to her is what she sees. If you hand them to her with the petals in your hand with the thorns out front, she's going to see thorns. OK, what that means is that in the past you have been hard to get along with. And now you all of a sudden try to do something nice for her. She's just going to see the thorns. So it's not just a matter of giving her some roses and fixing everything. We've got to start way back here at the marriage altar again. Starting with realizing that what I do affects her in the future. You know, we can't just all of a sudden expect to have a romantic evening out with our wife if the day before and the day before and the day before have been stress and tension in the home. It won't work. <clears throat> what happens then is that gift becomes a mockery. It becomes a mockery to her. If in the past you have been hard to get along with and you give her a gift, she just looks at that and, and just, what are you trying to say? It won't work. Same way, wives, with your husbands.
A few practical things to you wives. I just want to talk real quickly and briefly here. God says you are to reverence your husbands. Now reverence is more than submission. Submission will do what he asks you to do. But reverence does what he wants before he even asks. Number two, your husband needs inspiration. You have the power to inspire or kill inspiration. You can inspire him, but you must first be inspired yourself. Have your quiet time. Guard that quiet time. Have a relationship with your God so that you can be inspired. So that you can know what is the right way to go. So that you can have the Holy Spirit living in you. And you can listen to Him and He can teach you and He can guide you. Be a spiritual woman if you want to inspire your husband. He needs to know you are praying for him. Pray the scriptures for him. Put your name in the scriptures someplace, in some places where you can. And pray the scriptures. Pray for him. Let your children hear you pray for him. Pray in your closet. Pray out loud. Pray for your husband. Wives, we need your prayers. James says that the, the effectual, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I think it's also safe to say that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous woman avails much too. You can avail much in us. Number five. Keep your expectations low. Now that's not to say that he, he only has to meet them. But when you put your expectations so high and he doesn't meet them, I encourage you, keep your expectations low. Keep your expectations low. Your job is to reverence him. Your job is to honor him. Take those expectations you may have to God and let him fill those expectations. Whatever you may have, you need something, you want something, take them to God. When your expectations are too high, you set him up for disappointment and yourself up for disappointment. Let him raise the expectations. Wives, let him raise the expectations. Let his life grow and grow and grow. And you just follow along and bless him. Does your prayer need to change from Lord, change him to Lord, change me. Lord, change him to Lord, change me. Husbands, I have some things I'd like to say to you. She, your wife, must be and she needs to know it. Number one in your life. Especially so if you have wounded her confidence in some way in the past. If you have hurt her some way in the past, your wife needs to know she's number one. And I believe for me in my life, that has been a key for me. To recognize that I owe my wife something. I owe it to her. I have a debt to pay. And I need to pay it. I have that need. And she needs to know that she is number one. Don't just expect her to automatically know that she's number one. Tell her. Show her. She needs to be shown constantly. She needs to be told constantly. Words will only wound if the life does not match up with what you're saying. If she's not number one in your life, and you say she is when your actions tell her so differently, they only hurt. Let your life be so you have dedicated your husband life to her. And she needs to know that. Cherish her. You know, cherish. I didn't look this word up. It's, I'm just going to give you my definition of cherish. It means to me, it would mean love in action to cherish your wife. She needs to feel cherished.
Not just a wife that does the things she needs to do and does the things she does, but a wife that is cherished. You, she knows you'll take time for her. You're sitting at your desk and she walks in. You should lay your pencil down and turn to her and say, Hi. <clears throat> Want to talk? You have time for her. There needs to be time for that. She needs to feel cherished. That you are more important than the work you're working on. Now, that all needs to be taken in the right context, and, and I think you all understand what I'm saying. But if every time she walks in, you don't have time for her, you're, you're doing something, she'll get the point after a while. She's not going to feel cherished. Just, just little things. There are so many things. You could show her and tell her how you cherish her. <clears throat> and there's another thing, husbands, that you need to do, that your wife will feel, will feel cherished and that she will feel loved, and that is... Take time with her children. She needs to know that you love her children because they're her children too. And you know, a mother's love for a child is sometimes different. And it is different than a father's love. Not that it's necessarily any less, but it's different. She needs to know that you love her, your children. She needs to know that. That's also going to be one of the things that will be the, just, just a building block in this, in this marriage, in this, in this uh, bonding together. It'll just be another rope round, wound around to hold you together. I think I've already touched on this, but she needs to be washed in the water of the word daily. She needs to be. You know, she can sit and listen to stacks of tapes, lots of sermons from other men. But you bring something to her and I can almost guarantee you it'll bless her like none of those tapes could. If her husband is out there digging in, getting out of the word, getting out of the scriptures, a, a spiritual nugget for her that he has to give to her. Husbands, show her she's precious to you. Go to the word and get something to give to her to wash her with. To make her feel like that you care about her and she's now ready to meet the day. And she has the protection of her husband over her spiritually. Go get something for her and give it to her daily. Many other things. She needs your support financially. She needs you to be upright in the body of Christ. In the church and as we work together. She needs you to be upright. Pressing forward, encouraging, blessing. That's a, that's a security to her. And it's a right security. It's a good thing for you to do. She needs you to be gentle and courteous. She does. She needs you to be helpful. And you know, she needs you to be home when you're home. Do you understand what I mean? I admit, I have been home without being at home. She needs that. That'll make her feel cherished. If you can leave all your problems out there in the shop, on the job, in the office, just leave them there and go home and be home. Your responsibility, husbands, is to watch over your wife. She's a precious, needy treasure. God made them that way. Don't despise it. Don't despise it. It's pretty easy, maybe, to get a little impatient sometimes. I'm encouraging you tonight. God made her that way. She is... God told her that... The husband would rule over her. That's the way she is. God made her that way. Don't despise it. She is the weaker vessel. You are the leader. Not to lord it over her, but to love her. Not to control her, but to content her. Not to overpower her, but to undergird her. Not to push her, but to protect her. That's what we need to be as husbands. 
I have a father-in-law one time. I'll tell that story later. <clears throat> so I guess the question tonight is, are we husbands loving our wives the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? Are we wives reverencing our husbands? Even as Sarah did to Abraham, calling him Lord. What is our marriage like? And in your relationship together, what are you giving your children? What are you showing to your children? As you and your wife, you, your, you and their mother live together, what are you showing them? What are you teaching them about marriage? What are you teaching them about Christ and the church? What are you teaching them? Are you teaching them love? How to cherish? How to nourish? How to reverence? How to honor? How to give yourself for her? When Satan destroys the home, he destroys the church. It's true. I had a father-in-law. I have a father-in-law. Maybe I've told this story here before. I don't, I don't remember. <clears throat> a little more than three years ago. He was... I don't know what time it was. 5.30 in the morning. 5 o'clock. I'm not sure what time it was. He got up. He walks every morning. He has a treadmill down the basement. He goes down the basement. He walks. For his health, he just likes to walk. He got up one morning, went downstairs, went down to his treadmill and started walking. Before he gets done walking in the morning, his wife usually gets up, makes breakfast. <clears throat> he gets done walking, she has breakfast ready. They sit down, eat breakfast together. <clears throat> they have their little devotion there together then. Well, one morning he got up. He went down to walk. He came back upstairs. Nothing. He walked into the bedroom. There she was. She was gone. She just died, just like that. He had no idea. She seemed to be a healthy, healthy woman. <clears throat> she had a few health problems, but never were we expecting her to die just like that. He stood by the casket. A few days later, and he said, Words I'll never forget. Words I hope to say someday. Words I hope you can say someday. One or the other of you. Maybe I'll say them. Maybe my wife will say them. But he said words like this. He said, I have no regrets. Oh, that our marriage would be that way. That if we come up some morning and we find our lot wife laying in bed, gone. Can I say, I have no regrets. Will I be able to say, I have no regrets about my life, about the way I treated my wife, about the way I treated my husband. How when God looked down upon our marriage and he looked down and he saw us, can he say, Beautiful, beautiful. Let's pray. Heavenly Bridegroom, 
Heavenly Father, this evening, Father, we have looked at our marriages, we have looked at our relationships, and Father, this evening, I pray, Lord, that any word that was spoken tonight might be a word straight from your heart to the hearts of these dear people, Father. And I pray, Father, that if there's anything spoken here that would be a benefit, to be an encouragement, Lord, that it would take root and it would grow. I pray, Father, that you would help us to look at our marriages, that they may grow, that they may thrive. I pray, Father, that you would help us to see if there's any areas of our life and in our marriages where we are not fulfilling your word to us, where we have not given ourselves to our, to our wives as Christ gave himself to the church, or where we have not reverenced our husbands as Sarah did to Abraham. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you would Settle what I intended for to be the spirit of this message into our hearts, Lord. That our, that our marriages would just and only thrive and grow. And that they could be little pictures of Christ and the church. And that our homes could be solid. That our homes could be impervious to Satan. That he would have no way to get in. That we would be perfect in our relationships. I pray, Father, help us to be that way. Help us, Father, to see any area in our life where it's not that way. Where we're not treating our wife or our husband the way we should. Heavenly Father, I pray, come, Lord. And give us a clear word from you, Lord, of what we need in our hearts. Father, our cups are turned up and we're thirsty. We want a drink. So we would desire that you would stir in our hearts. And I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord has heard. He has heard your, your musings in your heart. He knows, he knows all the areas of your heart that you've looked at. He knows all of that. I'd like to give you a chance tonight, an opportunity tonight to just to come either singularly, singularly or with your wife, your spouse. And maybe you need to just clear up some things. Maybe you need to bring something before the Lord tonight. Maybe there is a rift in your marriage that you know has been there and you want to clear it up. I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that this evening. Maybe you just need to renew your wedding vows, the spirit of your vows. I don't know. But I want us to go forth from this place tonight with a new vision for our marriages. A heart that is given over to develop our marriage relationship. Sam, do you have a song? 653. As we sing, I would just invite you, if you have any needs, anything you'd like to deal with the Lord about, or even with one another, to come forward and to the altar and make it right tonight.
Thank you for listening to this message. We trust that it has been a blessing to you. If you would like additional sermons or a catalog, please visit our website at effortofministries.org. Call us toll-free at 855-557-7902 or write to us at Ephrata Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephrata, Pennsylvania, 17522. You are welcome to copy this message for free distribution. This ministry is supported by your donations. May the Lord Jesus bless you.